and two. There we go. Hallelujah. Well, welcome this morning to those of you that are here, and uh, we just welcome those that will be coming as the service goes on. And uh, for those that are still on holidays, uh, may they have a great holiday and be safe. Amen. Father, we give you the praise, glory, and honor. We thank you for this morning. We thank you for all that you're doing and all that you're going to do. We thank you for a great uh, weekend of baptism. Although there was no baptisms, we will do that soon. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for the weekend camp out, though, and the movie, and, uh, and just the people that showed up. And Lord, thank you for Matthew, who took care of the house on that Sunday when we were away. We thank you, Lord, for that, and uh, ask that you just bless each and every one of us here this morning and those that are coming. Lord, I ask that you would just uh, open up heaven this morning with miracle signs and wonders, Lord. If there's a need in the house, that that need would be met. I thank you for touching every uh, sickness and every disease right now in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you for the power over darkness in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. 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 Welcome this morning. Why don't we just stand up this morning as we enter into worship and uh, let's have a great time this morning. Amen. All right. It's in a place where you're just not feeling his presence. You need to draw close to him. Amen. We need to follow the word. The word tells us exactly what to do, how to get close to Jesus. How to, how to feel his presence, amen? And, uh, you know, as we worship him, we, we just engage in his presence and uh, lift our hands and our hearts to him. Just like the trees lift their leaves when it's going to rain. Anyone ever notice that? They flip their leaves and they expect the rain, amen? We need the rain of heaven on our lives, and the only way we can receive that is by lifting up our hands and saying, Lord, I receive you. There's no way to the Father but through Jesus Christ. There's no way that you can have the connection without asking Jesus Christ into your heart and into your life. And the way you do that is to say, Lord, come into my life and forgive me. Maybe you've asked him to forgive you before. You can ask him as many times as you need to ask him. There's no limit, amen? But it's really good if you ask him to forgive you and then change your ways. Amen? Don't continue down the same road you were on before. The Bible says when you become a new creation, you change your ways. Your mindset's changed. Your thoughts are changed. You are not the same person you were before. Amen? Are we good? Okay, good. Whew. thought you guys left me there for a second. <clears throat> Couldn't even hear you breathing. Don't hold your breath no longer, please. You know, it reminds me of the, uh, remind me of the church where they had to... Uh, he called an ambulance for someone who passed away. It took six people before they found out which one passed away. <laughs> That's a dead church. Amen? So, we got to look alive. Did you hear about the Energizer Bunny? He was arrested. He was, uh, he was charged with battery. <laughs> battery? <laughs> you know, charged with battery. <laughs> <laughs> <That's a talk. laughs> Hallelujah. Anyway, praise the Lord. Well, like I said, we had a great baptism uh, weekend. Uh, the camp out was awesome. Amen. Hardly any rain until Sunday. <laughs> and then she poured. <laughs> that was the first time in our history that we've had to not do the baptism, by the way. Even though there was rains and clouds and, and our gazebo was even taken this time. And... Um, you know, I think if there would have been another gazebo, we would have been fine. We would have still had our picnic. But when, when there was no place to go and the wind was howling and, you know. Uh, but anyway, nevertheless, we're going to do a baptism um, in, outside our church walls here in the parking lot. Uh, maybe not next week, but the following week maybe or something. We'll just pick a Sunday when it looks like it's going to be nice and hot. And we're going to pull out a trough, just like I was baptized in. I was baptized in a water trough. And then... Uh, you know, it, it, it works great, and we're doing it for Jesus, not for man, right? So we don't need to be in the, in the comfort of a lake, right? I'm even going to put cold water in there so that it feels like the lake. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. We'll make sure it's warm. <laughs> so we take a bath at home. Amen? So we'll, we'll, do, a, we'll do our baptism. You know what? It is, it is really about you surrendering your life and making the changes and just saying, you know what? I want to follow Jesus uh, look, I've never followed him before. I want to dedicate this time and, this, and, and, and the rest of my life to doing what Christ has called me to do. Amen? And just, you know, being a part of the kingdom and uh, just dropping all the things that you know are wrong. <laughs> Amen? And uh, eliminating those from your life. 
and uh, doing your best to follow him. Amen? So we're going to do that coming up. Be, just stay tuned. So if you didn't get baptized, you will get baptized. And uh, um, yeah, so it'll be, it'll be good. If you'd like to give this morning to uh, Yorkton Victory Church, you can give it online at yvcadmin at sastel.net. Or you can give by the ushers that will come around and take up the offering here shortly. Um, there are going to be a couple of some ushers coming around shortly, so be ready for that. If you have not received an envelope, anything over $20 gives you a tax receipt, but you need to mark it down on, uh, on, uh, on the envelope. Your name is clearly printed, your address is clearly printed, and, uh, and the amount is clearly printed. Amen? So if you can do that, you will receive a tax receipt. Um, if you don't give it, if you just drop it cash in the, env- in the offering uh, basket, then uh, there won't be a tax receipt because we don't know who you are. Amen? <clears throat> All right, Tuesday night Bible studies, amen, you guys have been there, Tuesday night Bible studies, how's the Bible studies going, aren't they great, <laughs> hallelujah, yeah, amen, thanks to uh, those that helped out last week when Joanna and I were away on holidays, and uh, still kind of on holiday, Shannon's going to be preaching this morning, and uh, so we're going to get a word from her, we haven't heard from her in a while, and, uh, and actually then I'm going to Cold Lake to a, a, we- a wedding next week, and Shannon will be uh, carrying on her message then too, so don't be tired of Shannon. You guys, make sure she's welcome. And, uh, and uh, yeah, she, she does an awesome job of bringing forth the word. So, Amen. So uh, Tuesday night Bible study, 7 p.m. Don't miss it. It's an awesome time. If, you're, if you want more of the word, more of the meat of the word, that's a great place to get it. Come and, come and get it. Amen. So I've had people say, well, you know what? We need more meat. And uh, that's where you get it, right there at Bible study. We can discuss things. We can talk about things and have a great discussion. Amen. Awesome. So Tuesday night, uh, anything else I'm missing? The movie night, would you, those of you that are at the, at the uh, camp out, did you enjoy the movie? I think that worked great, eh? Face Like Potatoes, I think we're going to show that again. That was a good show. That was a really good show, and uh, it really, uh, I think it would be great to po- just put it up on the outside of the building here. And so before the snow flies, we are going to do a, uh, another drive-in movie in our parking lot. Amen. And then we can just tune in with that FM thing. I think that works great, too. Amen? So, awesome. Is there anything else I'm missing, Joanne? I'm missing you. <laughs> we spent a great time after camp out at the lake. We went to Madge for a week, Joanne and I, and just spent the whole week together. It was awesome. Just spending just complete time with her, walking every day. Just, you know, just, it was just great. It just should have lasted longer. <laughs> anyway, so it was great. So we had a great time. And uh, um, but yeah, so any, other than that, we'll just take up the offering taken up. Okay, let's do that. Father, I thank you for the tithes and offerings this morning. I ask that you just bless those that can give this morning. And uh, Lord, just be with each and every one of us as we do what you told us to do. You said give, and we will receive. So Lord, we give today, and we expect a harvest. Amen? Amen. Go ahead and take it up, guys. <clears throat> and then Shannon, I guess I don't think there's any other announcements, is there? Okay, take it away, Awesome. I'm just going to get myself organized here. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, Nice to see some friendly faces back in church this morning. That's awesome. We're going to start collecting our people back. Um, My message this morning is called Going from a Naysayer to a Yaysayer. So let's get some positivity going here. So I don't know about you, but <clears throat> lately I've just been noticing that a lot of people are very negative lately. And I don't know if it's from the cabin fever from COVID-19 of people not being able to get places or do things, 
or whether it's frustration because they've got all these blocked goals, you know, like blocked goals is when you can't get done what you need to get done because of obstacles that are in your way or you get frustrated because you need to get A, B, and C done and things just keep stopping you from doing that. Well, that's like blocked goals and that can be very frustrating for people. So I don't know what's going on or maybe it's just me, but I'm just seeing like lots of people that are kind of a little bit down lately. And I feel like people are starting to give up their fight. They're kind of rolling over and making excuses for things that they can't get done. They're giving up on their dreams. They're kind of pushing things aside. You know, like, it's like, oh, <clears throat> like I used to want to be able to do this or go back to school or, or I don't have enough money. My job really sucks, but I can't get ahead in it. And then instead of finding ways around it, they, they just all of a sudden start coming up with all these excuses why they can't get to the end of their goal. They can't reach their result. Um, so, you know, maybe sure there's one or two real struggles in your life. Like, you, know, you need a new job, but you can't get to it. You don't have a car. So that's what, that would be a real struggle. But then you kind of find those ways around that, right? Well, maybe I could take the bus or maybe I could carpool with somebody or you kind of find ways around that struggle. But people tend to be like, well, I don't have a car and, well, well, I don't have any clothes that would be appropriate for that work. And they end up talking themselves to the point where it's like, well, why do I even bother getting out of bed now? Because, like, nothing is going to go right. So um, it, you can kind of spiral into this real downward trend when you're always finding reasons not to do things. You know, it's like not coming to church. Well, I don't want to come to church because, well, there might be COVID. And, oh, I don't want to come to church because, you know, maybe this might happen. Or uh, they're probably full. Or, oh, I'm going to be five minutes late. I might as well not go there. You can talk yourself out of not coming to church. doesn't matter. Get here. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, I, I always like to use this analogy. Um, when you're frustrated and you're kind of overwhelmed by everything, it's like you're standing in front of a wall and the wall's like two inches away from your face. You're standing right up against a wall and it consumes your peripheral vision. Everywhere you look, like you're so close to it that all you see is a wall. It's overwhelming and consuming because that's all you can see. But if you just took two steps back, enough just to kind of look at your situation and realize what was going on, you would notice that there's literally a door right beside you. You were so consumed by what was happening, but there was a way out right beside you. So sometimes we need to stop looking at our situations. We need to step back. We need to look for solutions. And often things are going to be right there in front of us. You see, God always provides a way. He always provides a way. It might not be our way. It might not be the way we would have chosen to do something. But he always provides a way. He's always there. And that being said, God does provide ways for us, but we need to have some resiliency in us. And resiliency is the capacity to overcome um, difficulties quickly. It's kind of a toughness that you have. It's the ability to spring back from being pushed down. And so it seems that our culture is not providing that resiliency in our children. And we need to start that process to cultivate that resiliency again. Our culture takes away problem solving, and we're programmed to just listen and do what's proposed. If you don't do what the world tells you to do, then we're labeled as haters and bigots. And that is not true. Um, we don't have the resiliency to stand up against that when people are... are are saying, this is what you are. If you don't follow what we are, then you must hate. If you don't follow our rules, then you must be a bigot. And we need the resiliency to be able to be like, no, that's not the truth. Um, Christians are not haters and bigots. We are the exact opposite. We should be seeing everybody the way Christ sees everybody. We should be loving every single person the way Christ loves every single person. But we don't have to accept everybody's behavior, and we don't have to accept everybody's beliefs. But we have to love everybody. And there is a difference in that. I also want to caution that challenging the world's ways does not mean becoming rebellious. It doesn't mean going out and breaking the law because you don't agree with it. 
Okay, we're, I just want to caution you on that. We need to come under authority of the government, and we need to pray for our government, which is so, so important. They need to be lifted up in prayer so we get the right people in there, especially now this election is coming up. Every one of us should be on our knees praying for this election that's coming up and getting yourself to the polls to pray for the right people to get in. I just want to clarify that. So we need to pray for our government and come under our authority. Um, I don't want everybody to become rebellious about um, the law or anything like that. So, um, so God provides ways and means, but we, we need to be willing to take that step to meet him halfway. We have a responsibility in these things. We need to be willing to say yes to God and not no. We need to say, yes, I can, not I can't. We need to start saying positive things. We need to say, yes, I'm available. Yes, I can do it. Yes, I, I'm, I'm here, Lord. And I'm telling you <clears throat> that we are not very good witnesses for Christ when we walk around looking downtrodden and defeated and being negative. Like this, yeah, my day really sucks and I don't know, like nothing's going right and yeah, I don't know, I just, nothing's happening. But I'm a Christian and I go to church every Sunday and I believe in God, but I don't know what he's going to do. That's not a witness for anybody. When you walk in and you're like, you know what, my life is completely following apart, but I don't care because God's in control and I'm going to be positive about this day. Hallelujah, God's got this. People look at you sideways and go, what is wrong with you? Because people expect you to be sad and downtrodden. But it's in conflict, it's contradictory to being a Christian and being downtrodden. You can't have both. So if Christians, it doesn't matter what we're facing, we need to be standing upright, praising God with a smile on our face because it doesn't matter what's going to happen because God's in control. And that is a powerful witness. If you're a born-again believer, then you have Christ in you. And you become an unstoppable powerhouse because of the power of the cross. Now, Philippians 4.13, it's very familiar. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. We can do all things through Christ. It's not our power. It's not our will. It's not our ability. But it's through Christ that allows us to do all of these things. It's by his power and his will that we can get these things done. But we have to say yes. We have to say yes to him. We have to be willing to ask him for that. We have to be willing to come under his authority and say, whatever you want, God. But you have to say yes to God. With God, there's always a two-part equation. It's God, and it's you and me. It's us. There's God and you. God offers grace, but we have to accept it. God died for our sins, but we have to accept him as Lord. God provides a way always, but we have to be willing to take it. God provides free will, but we have to be willing to accept him and the consequences for not taking him or the good consequences for taking him. God will forgive our sins, but we need to confess them to him. He just doesn't forgive our sins if we aren't willing to confess them. It's a two-way street, and we have a part to play in how God um, acts in our life. So God wants us to become, yes, men and women, and we need to overcome our roadblocks and obstacles instead of giving up and becoming negative about things. So I'm not sure if this is a new concept for you, but we live in a spiritual world, and there's good and evil forces that are engaged constantly around us. And Satan roams the earth looking for those that he can devour. The Bible talks about that. He's looking for the weakness. He's looking for people that he can disturb in their lives. And when we just roll over, over every little obstacle, we make it easy for the enemy to win and to diminish our testimony, and to make us stumble in our walk and feel defeated. And you know what? God knows this. Jesus himself was tempted in the desert. Matthew 4, 1 to 11. So this is when Jesus um, went out, was led out into the desert. And it said, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. 
After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. I'd be hungry too. And the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourselves down, for it is written, I will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put your Lord the God, Lord your God to the test. And again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And then the devil left him, and the angels came and attended him. You know, and then I have these little notes in my Bible here. And it says that Jesus would not accomplish his mission by using his supernatural power for his own needs. And that was dealt with in the first temptation. He wasn't going to use all of that to feed himself. He wasn't going to use those miracles to provide for himself. And, or he wasn't going to use his power to win a large following by miracles or magic, um, as some, of, some may have interpreted that. And that was the second temptation. Or he wasn't going to compromise with Satan, and that was the third temptation. The example Jesus set was that we will be tempted. Excuse me. There's no doubt. We are going to be tempted. But we, will, we can overcome the enemy by not praying for selfish needs. You know, we can't pray, oh God, like I'm so much in debt, I just need you to fix my finances. Like if I just won $5 million, then that would solve all my problems, I could pay off all my debt, and then everything would be fine. I just need money to pay my debt, my life would be great. But you know the problem with that? Like if God were to answer that prayer you don't ever figure out how you got into that debt and it's never fixed. You get rescued from that situation. So it's very likely that God is never going to answer that because we need to learn. And he loves us enough not to rescue us from situations. And the other thing is there is no bargaining with the enemy. You can't leave a door open, not even a tiny bit, Jesus commanded Satan to leave, and he used Scripture to back up his statements. Scripture is powerful, and I don't think we understand the gravity of how powerful Scripture is. When we do warfare, we need to use Scripture. Then Satan can't twist the words or argue with you. Satan knows the truth, and he's hoping that you don't know it. And he did the same thing in the Garden of Eden. He took God's words and he twisted them enough so that the woman was like, oh, yeah, well, yeah, God didn't really say that. And even when Jesus was in the desert, Satan was using scripture to try to twist the words and get Satan to crumble and get Jesus to crumble and be like, oh, yeah, God did say that. But Jesus was the word and he knew and it's like, no, he said this, but God also said this and I'm not succumbing to that. Jesus knew the truth and he knew the word. And so we need to be wise like that and know our Bibles so that Satan can't twist the word on us. We'll know when things are being manipulated a little bit. And we're like, no, nope, that's not the truth. Wrong context. So we're changing gears a little bit. We have, I have a little sidebar story that will come around and be applicable. But So Scott and I are waiting for a puppy. We've been waiting for a little while. And so we've been watching videos, and we have this um, puppy culture video on, on um, raising p puppies. And so it follows this life of this litter for about three years. And so... Um, she teaches these puppies kind of independence, and she's showing that um, allowing puppies to struggle and, and be independent and, and um, allowing them to think for themselves and problem solve allows these puppies to grow up to be better prepared as adults, less aggressive, more friendly, able to problem solve, more confident, that kind of thing. 
So there's this one puppy that really struggles with everything. I think she's a little bit slow. So all the whole puppy, she puts little barricades up for them that are completely obtainable. The puppies can get over them. And the whole litter gets out and runs out, but this one puppy struggles and struggles and struggles, and she whines and complains and moans and does everything. She just can't get over this, like, three-inch barrier that her whole litter got over. And so the lady that's doing this says, I know that she can get over this. She's the right age. All of her other litter mates could do this. She needs to learn this to be able to grow in confidence. And if I rescued her right now and lifted her over this, this would only teach her, as long as I whine and scream loud enough, somebody's going to rescue me. And I will never have the confidence to be able to figure out that how I have to get over this little three-inch ledge. She'll never be able to figure that out. And by helping her, she's actually going to harm her developmental process. So it's kind of funny to watch this little puppy. She figures it out eventually. And, you know, like the, the, the breeder's like encouraging her and says, you can do it. Come on, you can do it. And is there with her. She doesn't abandon her. She encourages her. And this puppy gets over the ledge. And then you see as the weeks go on, this puppy starts to develop this, like, a an ability and a confidence that she learns to overcome these things and learns how to think and problem solve and how to get around obstacles to get her food. So I'm thinking, as I'm watching this video, I'm like, that can apply to us. That so happens with us. That, a pr that whole principle can be applied to us and our children as well. So you look at the history. The more struggles people faced, the more resilient they were. The pioneers, like really? Like look at how many obstacles they came up with. Like every day was a challenge and they just kept springing back and pushing through and enduring. And then you have um, the Great Depression. Those people that lived through the Great Depression are the most resilient people and the most, like my grandma was there and my dad always said, she put her in a cave with a needle and a thread and she could come out with anything you wanted. Like they could just find things. The world wars. Those people were so resilient. It brought people together. It strengthened everybody. When you have victory over huge obstacles, the little struggles seem so simple. They don't even seem like a struggle because you've overcome the mountain that the gopher hill is nothing. But when all you have is gopher hills, that is insurmountable. When you see a mountain, it's like, oh, I struggled with the gopher hill. I, don't, I can't do that. And we don't have challenges in our lives. Like, things are so, so simple for us. We protect our children so much, we don't allow them to struggle. We give them awards for just showing up for things. The rate of anxiety and depression and inability to problem solve and function as adults is increasing at an exponential rate. And it's because we kind of keep rescuing our children and we don't want them to suffer. We don't want them to struggle. We want their lives to be easy. But that is not healthy and that's not good for anybody. A little bit of struggle is good for everybody. And when we can wrap our brains around that, that having an easy life is not the right thing to do, then you can understand why God allows us to struggle a little bit. He's trying to teach us that you can get over this little three-inch lip. I know you can do it because you're going to build your confidence when you do that. So don't be afraid when those struggles come. Don't get angry and frustrated. Think of it as like, you know what? I'm training. I'm building my confidence because I know that I can do this. Some people have difficulty making decisions because they can't commit to anything. I don't know if it's because something might come along later and something's going to be better that comes along. They're like, well, I don't know how I'm going to feel that day. I don't know what's going to be happening. I just, well, I'll see how it is. I'll play it by ear. You know, they live a, lo a life full of constant uncertainty and they may label it as flexibility. Oh, I'm just a flexible person. Oh, I'm not a planner. I just like to go with the flow. I'm fluid. And those are all excuses as far as I'm concerned because there's no commitment and there's no accountability and there's no follow-through. When you don't commit to anything, nobody can hold you accountable. 
When you say, I'm going to be there at 5 o'clock, and you don't show up, somebody's going to be like, well, I'm a little bit disappointed. I thought we had plans at 5. But if you're like, I don't know, might come, might not come, I'm not sure, there's no accountability. There's no reason for you to, to make a way to have any effort to do anything. So I'm calling all of you out who are flexible people and non-planners. I'm challenging you and saying that you guys have commitment issues. We're going to read Ephesians 4.14. It says, then we know we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. So he's talking about like when we mature, when we're no longer infants, this is not going to happen. So basically, if we are still infants, we're going to be tossed about by the waves. We're going to be deceived. Cunning people are going to be able to come by and deceitfully twist words on us or lead us astray because we're infants. We're tossed about. We have no commitment. We're not firm on anything. Then there's James 1.6 that also talks about that. James 1.6 says, But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt. Because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. And that man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. Now in this scripture, um, it says, but when he asks, he was actually talking about asking for wisdom. But I think it can apply to anything that you ask for. So when you ask, you have to believe and you can't doubt. You ask God for something and you have to believe it. Because when you start to doubt, then you become tossed about like the waves in the ocean. It's like, God, I just pray that you would answer this prayer. But you might not. So if you don't, that's okay. And then, well, maybe you weren't going to do this, but maybe this was going to happen. And, well, um, I don't know now. Is that the enemy trying to attack me? Is that you saying, no, I, I just don't know what's happening now, God. And, and you're confused and you're double-minded. And it says, that man or woman, should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded and unstable in all he does. We need that concrete commitment. God, I'm asking you for this. I trust that you're going to provide this because I know that you are a faithful God, and I'm standing firm, and I'm going to press in on that, and I'm going to pray and pray and wait for you, Lord. And if things come back and forth, we're not tossed about. We're not, we're not confused. We're not back and forth. I'm staying committed to the Lord. Lord, you promised me. I know I heard from you. This is what you said, and you come back with Scripture, and you aren't tossed about. Then God answers your prayer. But as long as you're wishy-washy and don't commit to anything, how can God work with that? If you can't commit to plans being made for the next week, how can you commit to God? If he asks you to do something, you can't say, mm, I'll think about that. Or, yeah, well, I'll do that like later. It's not really not my time. No, when God tells you to do something, you do it. But you, if you can't even make decisions and commitments to people, how will you be able, be able to do what God wants you to do? You need to start by saying yes to God. And don't worry about anything else. Whatever may come, God has it. Trust him and say yes to the Lord. Don't think about all of anything that could happen. God asks you to do something, you do it. It's like you're in the shopping mall and God says, go pray for that woman. Don't think, oh, they're going to think that I'm weird. Well, I don't know. Was that really you, God? I'm not sure. Well, mm. and then you hum and haw and then the opportunity is gone. And then you kind of beat yourself up and you're like, oh, see, I should have done that. Well, that's okay. Just confess and ask God that you would give, have another opportunity. But, you know, when he says do it, go do it. Don't question. Don't question what's happening. Just do it. We need to rise up and find a way through our obstacles. We need to step back and look at our situation. And instead of seeing all the possible obstacles, look at all the possibilities. Find ways to say yes and reasons to say no. You know, 
when David was with Goliath and he killed Goliath, he said yes to God. The army was finding all kinds of reasons to say no, and they were held up for a long time. But David came, and he's like, hello, God's with you. What are you guys talking about? I'm just going to go get some stones, throw at the giant. He calls, falls over. We win. End of story. It seems so simple. It's like the army couldn't do that. It's because David said yes to God, and he didn't look at the obstacle ahead of him. He didn't look at the giant. He didn't talk himself out of it. He obeyed God. God said, face the giant, get this, this is what you need to do. Absolutely, that's what I'm doing. God's going to deal with it. You've asked me to do this, that's what needs to be done. God's going to fix everything else. I don't have to worry about the logistics. God is the logistics professional, not us. So we ask God to see miracles and signs and wonders, but then we refuse to step out in faith and believe and believe that God can do miraculous things. So, you know, part of my own testimony is that um, I I went back to college when I was 43 years old to become a licensed practical nurse. Like, A, who does that in their right mind? And I hadn't been to school since I was 18 years old, So my brain was a little old and foggy. And all of this, well, we were trying to do a major renovation on the house. Scott and I literally were working paycheck to paycheck. It's not like we had a nice retirement nest egg. It's not like we had a big savings chunk. We're like, well, we'll just take this money and we'll live off this while you're going to school. No, 43 years old, paycheck to paycheck. Oh, we're doing these renovations too. God goes, you need to go to school. Because I realized the only way out of this paycheck-to-paycheck situation was to get an education. God says, go to school. Well, there could have been a lot of obstacles. There could have been a lot of things that we said, nope, too many obstacles, can't do it. Who does this? And then where would we have been? But nope, we decided to trust God. And we stepped out in faith. And that was a big faith walk. It was like jumping off the edge of a cliff. But then not only was I in school, but Scott decided to go back to be a CCA at the same time. So both of us are going to school. And we have four children, although they were, they were like in high school and getting a little bit older. But we had a mortgage and we had car payments. And when I look back and think about that, there would have been so many obstacles that could have stopped us from going forward. But we decided to step out in faith. And I'm telling you, every single one of those things was a miracle. We, we think that You know, we need a huge thing to be a miracle, but I'm telling you, two years of paying a mortgage and having food on the table every single day while people are going to school is a miracle. And another miracle through all of that was that, oh, we decided to do an Africa missions trip at the same time. Well, that's not cheap either, but we end up going to Africa on a missions trip. Like, God even blessed us to do that. Like, that was crazy. So by overcoming the obstacle and seeing God's faithfulness gave me the ability to trust God that two years after I became an LPN, he says, you need to go back to school again, except this time it's going to be for four years. Mm, Okay, God. And so I go back and I do this, I do it all again, and God was faithful again. But if we hadn't gone through the two years of all of this, I would have never had the faith and and grown in the Lord the way I did to be able to make that step to go again. But because we had that history, I knew full well God was going to take care of everything. So when we have those struggles and those obstacles and we're able to overcome those mountains, it grows our faith and our relationship in the Lord. So we chose faith. We chose to find ways to say yes for the plan God had for our lives. And was it hard? Absolutely. Were there challenges? Yes. Were there trials? Yes. Was it a faith walk? Yes. But there was also lots of blessings and miracles. And my faith and relationship with God grew. So Luke 1, 3 to 7. Where are we here? Luke. Oh, for nothing is impossible with God. If you look at that, nothing is impossible with God. 
it's not nothing is impossible for God. We all know nothing is impossible for God. God can do everything. But it's nothing is impossible with God. We are with God. It shows a relationship with us. And it's through God that allows us to do the impossible things. That is a key word. Nothing is impossible with God. Lots of things are impossible without him. But with God, nothing is impossible. So don't miss that word. Matthew 11, 22 to 24, says, Have faith in God, Jesus answered. I tell you the truth. If anyone says to this mountain, Go throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done, done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him so that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins. We need to come to God with a clean heart. You can't have unforgiveness in your heart and expect God to answer your prayers. Remember, it's a two-way street. God is there for you, but you have to give a little. You know, God doesn't expect much. You don't have to clean yourself up and be perfect to come to him. He wants you to come to him as you are, imperfect and broken and blemished. But he does want your heart. That's what he wants is your heart. And a little faith goes a long way. God loves you and has a plan for you. And we all know Jeremiah 29, 11, 13, 11 to 13. But we'll just read it, just to get it in our brain here. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. And then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. You know, I, I know people usually just do the, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans for a hope and a future, and they stop there. God has a plan for me. Awesome. And they fail to carry on and say, but then you will call upon me and come and pray to me. We need to come and pray to God and get before him and get on our knees, and then God listens to us. And then when he listens, it says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. So again, that is a responsibility on our end. That is an action that is required by us. God has these promises, but we have to come to him humbly before him and seek his face. And then he gives us these things that he's promising us. It's a relationship that he wants. It's not just God doing things for us. It's God working with us together because he wants a relationship with us. If it's always him just doing something, that's not a relationship. He wants to work together with us. So sometimes we find ourselves in difficult situations, and not because God put us there, but because of our own choices. You know, God is not a micromanager. He does not control every aspect of everything. He totally has the ability to control everything, but he doesn't. He allows us free choice, and we have those consequences of the choices that we made, both good and bad. And sometimes our actions are set in place a course that has to be worked out. But we are never too far from his hand, and we are never too far from his grace. But he does let us learn from our consequences in order to grow and mature us and to learn from the mistakes we've made. He's like that breeder with that puppy. He's there. He's encouraging us. He's walking with us. But he doesn't want to rescue us. He wants to see us overcome our challenges and learn from our behaviors. And he doesn't leave us alone. He's there cheering us on, saying, you can do this. I'm here with you. I'm ready. Come to me. You can do this. He doesn't leave us alone. You know, babies fall when they're learning to walk because of laws of gravity, not because their parents are going around pushing them down. But all of that falling allows the baby to learn to walk and problem solve. Babies are incredibly resilient little creatures that are tenacious about learning. Have you ever seen a baby give up walking? Ah, oh, I tried three times. I'm not going to walk. That was too hard. 
I fell down, that's it. They don't give up on crawling. Some babies don't crawl. They scoot on the floor, they roll around. You know, they might not do it in their traditional way, but they learn their own way to do things. They don't give up, they problem solve. It's like, I want that toy over there and I gotta get it. How do I get there? And they learn that this is what they need to do. But then the problem comes in when we see them struggle. We want to help them. And then we start doing things for them, and we start to break that resiliency. I'm not saying neglect your child. I'm not saying don't be there. I'm saying a little bit of challenge, age-appropriate challenge, is good for everybody. And it's better to encourage somebody in their struggle than to rescue them. And we're very good at rescuing people because we hate seeing people hurt. We hate seeing people struggle. But if you come alongside somebody who's hurting and struggling and say, I'm going to walk with you, instead of saying, I'm going to rescue you out of this situation, you are going to see more growth and more resiliency and more healing in that than actually rescuing somebody. So, you know, God doesn't go around pushing us down, creating challenges in our lives, but he doesn't always rescue us either. But he's willing to walk with you through any of your challenge you're facing. He's trying to create resiliency in you, and he's trying to help you build faith in him as you learn from your mistakes and challenges. So if you're facing challenges, I want you to step back and look at your surroundings. Is God providing a way out that you didn't see before? Are you willing to learn to be resilient so the enemy can't take you out so easy? Are you willing to get back up and fight one more time? Are you willing to pick yourself up and try? Are you willing to say yes to what God has planned for you? Are you willing to commit to him what he's asking you to do? Are you willing to come to God and confess to him and seek his face? Are you willing to allow God to walk with you through your struggles and not ask you to rescue him, to rescue you from them? I hope you're willing to say yes to all God has for you because when you start saying yes, your life starts to change. And God wants to make us better people. So I encourage you to always say yes to God. Don't worry about the challenges. Don't worry about the obstacles. Because he has a better way. He knows the way. He provides the way. And he's the logistics guy and he takes care of the details. He just wants our yes. So with that, if you guys need prayer and you want to come up to the altar after service and Pastor Mark will close, you know, come up for prayer and we can pray. But I want all of us to become yay-sayers. Good word, Shannon. <clears throat> Let's give her another hand. Hallelujah. You know, as she's talking, I'm just thinking about, you know, over my life and thinking about the different families and different and parents that, uh, that uh, you hear them talking in the supermarket and, and then you hear them years on, uh, later or whatever and they're still dealing with, uh, you know, at one time they're dealing with a child that wants something and they just give because the child starts to whine and, and then you hear them as a teenager, why are you always whining? You know, the child's older now, and, and the child's still whining and, uh, and, and stomping his feet, wanting whatever he wants, because that's what, that's what you've raised him to do. Amen? we got to watch how we raise our children, and we have to, uh, you know, God says if you love your child, you'll discipline your child. If you don't love your child, you, you, then you don't discipline your child. So discipline is not a bad thing, it's, it's a love thing, right? And I was thinking about her when she was talking about determination. I'm not going to keep preaching. I, I want you to come to the altar, and I want you to get prayer if you want prayer this morning. But I, but I want to say, like, when you look at the woman, with, the woman with the issue of blood, she was at her last, at, at the end of everything. She was, she was, she was, she's out of money. She's out of hope. She has nothing left. And she knows that Jesus can heal her. And she sees Jesus. And, and, and even though she risked her life, if she, if she would have been caught at the gate entering into town, she would have been stoned to death. Okay, because in that time, women that were on their, when women that were bleeding from their period were, were considered unclean, and they were not allowed to be in the community. 
Amen? So, that, so, so that's how it was, right? That, that was the rules, and that's the way it was done. But she knew that she, she had one hope, and that was to get a hold of Jesus. And, uh, and that's the same hope that you and I have. If we pull down, we, 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 we can pull down heaven, and we can pull on the hem of Jesus' garment and receive from him if we just cry out to him and go after him with all that we have without fear and intimidation. Stop worrying about what other people think. Start worrying about what God thinks of you. Don't worry about what people are doing around you. Worry about what God wants for your life. Amen? That's how she did it. She, 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 some say she probably crawled amongst the crowd because anytime you, anytime you see Jesus doing some walking, there was thousands of people around him at all times. Isn't that right? They couldn't even, even the disciples said, well, Jesus said, someone touched me. And he's going, well, there's many people around you. And there's people touching you all, all, everywhere. Like, how can you say someone just touched me? He said, no, no. He said, they didn't just touch me, but they pulled, they pulled a faith out of me. They pulled power from me, Right? And Jesus recognized that power leaving him and made her whole. And it, and it, it just, just reminds me of so many stories in the Bible, if we just read it, of, of faith and, 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 you know, and uh, how important it is to just believe in God can bring healing to your life. Amen? Even when you look at, the, 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 even you look at uh, uh, blind Bartimaeus, you know, sitting on the roadside, he could have just stayed like that forever. He had the right to beg. Blind Bartimaeus had the right to beg. He, he had a coat that he could beg with, and he had the right to beg. But he threw that coat off that day he'd seen Jesus because he knew that if he just cried out to Jesus, he would get a hold. Even when the, even when the disciples and everybody was saying, telling him to shut up because he was making too much noise, Jesus finally stopped and said, no, no, bring him to me. Right? Jesus doesn't want you hurting, and Jesus doesn't want you uh, without. He wants you to have the things that you need to complete the ministry and the life he's called you to live on this earth. Amen. And so we need, to, we need to go after all that Jesus has for us. And the only way you can do that is by determining in your heart today to say yes to him. If you've never asked Jesus Christ into your life, today's a great day to do that. If you've never said, Lord, come into my life and forgive me my sins, wash me clean, he will wash you clean today and you will become a brand new person. All your